Well, good morning, New Life. Um, let me add my uh, New Year's um, to Happy New Year's to all of y'all that uh, things have already been mentioned this morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name's Steve. I'm your Celebrate Recovery Ministry leader. Uh, my short commercial, we still meet on Thursday nights, every, night, every Thursday night at 6 o'clock if, for those of you that uh, need to come. I'd like to thank uh, Kyle, Jasper, and Allen for uh, having a confidence in me to give me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, and I also want to thank you, my church family, for not already getting up and leaving. Uh, seriously, my, my sole purpose of being here this morning is that I'm seeking to follow the call of God, my Lord, my Savior, Jesus Christ, and to serve Him where He'll have me to serve. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to start the new year in your house with your people. Thank you for the opportunity you've given me to share what you've laid on my heart with my church family today. I ask that you calm my nerves and that we leave here having a close worship relationship and experience with you. Amen. I think we can all say that we're glad 2020 is behind us, right? But you know what we need to not forget is the one and only mighty God that we serve doesn't work on a calendar like we do. His vastness and timelessness cannot be counted in 12-month increments. His plan is perfect, and He doesn't care whether it's 2020 or 2021. Amen? Amen. But in our humanness, in our short-sighted view of life, we generally take the opportunity at the beginning of the calendar to think about all the things we need to do to make ourselves a better, healthier person. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, resolutions like Kyle did last week. So does anybody make any New Year resolutions? You don't have to call them resolutions if you don't want to. You can call them, call them intentions or targets or objectives, goals, promises, ambitions. I don't think it would surprise any of us that research says that 80% of all of those will fail by the end of the second week in February. In other words, chances are in 45 days, those new habits you were determined to make part of your life that you will have given up on. Those things that you were positive were going to make you fill in the blank, a better person, a whatever. Those things that you were certain that you were going to change in your life are now just a bad memory. Healthline.com says that it takes anywhere from 18 to 254 days for a person to form a new habit and an average of 66 days for that behavior to become automatic. All of this refers to forming good habits. The difficulty of the habit determines how long it will take to make it stick. So how long do you think it would take to develop a habit like maybe having a donut with your coffee in the morning? One day? Two days? Two days? Is that what it takes? Two days? <clears throat> so on average, if we quit after 45 days, no wonder we fail at long-term important changes we want to make. Here's something interesting that I found while I was doing the research for this this morning. It's called the 2190 rule. Healthshots.com says that, that the 2190 rule will help you quit all your bad habits. So where has this been all my life, right? The website says the rule is simple enough. All you have to do is commit to a personal goal for 21 straight days. After three weeks, the pursuit of that, the pursuit of that goal should have become a habit. Once you've established that habit, you continually do it for another 90 days, and then it becomes a lifestyle change. Really? Really? So what are our most popular resolutions? I don't think there are any surprises here. What, what's the first, what's the number one thing that everybody's going to make their resolution about? Lose Exercise more, lose weight, uh, get organized, learn a new skill or a hobby, live life to the fullest, spend more money, spend less money, quit using tobacco. I thought that was an interesting one. Spend more time with family and friends, travel more and read more. I do think there's another resolution that many of us begin the year with, with the best of intentions of fulfilling, and that's to read our Bible every day. 
So if it takes an average of 66 days for a behavior to become a habit, if you begin January the 1st with daily Bible reading and hang in there until March the 7th, you will have formed a habit that can change your life forever. And let me share this little tidbit of information with you. During those 66 days, if you read just 16 minutes a day, you will have read the entire New Testament in those 66 days. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. How powerful is that? But God's not going to compete with your schedule. He could if he desired to do so, but rather than force himself on us, he tells us to be still then, and only then can we know that he is God. Today we're going to be all over chapter Psalm chapter 119, so you can go ahead and start turning there. The last time I had an opportunity to talk to you, Kyle gave me the passage, and it was only three verses. This time he gave me the topic, and since he's not here this morning, I chose the longest chapter in the Bible. It's 176 verses. But before everybody gets up to leave, let me say we'll, we'll be all over it, but we'll be jumping around, and, uh, and I promise you that we won't be covering the whole thing. I would challenge you, though, that, um, that you take the time to read the entire chapter so you can see the many benefits of reading and meditating on Scripture. But there's something that's very important that we've got to do before we start reading Scripture on a daily basis. And that first step is that we've got to pray. We've got to pray that God speaks to you through His Word. Pray for knowledge and good decision-making. Pray for wisdom to understand what you're reading. Pray and ask God to show you how to respond to his word. Pray and ask God to remind you of his word throughout the day. And pray for concentration to be free from distractions. Now I want to take a minute and talk about that last one. Pray for concentration to be free from distractions. Anybody else got this problem? I st I'll stand right here in front of you and tell you I have that that's the worst of my problem. I have two different issues that come up when I read my Bible. The first one is the one that's, it's, I'm not going to say easy, but fairly easy to kind of, kind of work through. I call these mind, mind rockets. These are things that while I'm reading, they just go, Shh. what am I going to eat for breakfast this morning? Or, Shh. what am I going to do this afternoon? Or, Shh. Squirrel. <laughs> <clears throat> Am I the only one that has that problem? No. no? But I'll tell you, the one that, that uh, th these distractions are fairly easy to kind of take care of because you can keep a notepad beside you and if something comes up, you can write that down and then you can kind of put it out of your mind. But the one that I have the worst problem with is the one I call mental beach banners. Now, how many of y'all like to go to the beach? That's not my favorite place in the world, but my wife loves to go to the beach. So while you're at the beach and you're, you're trying to relax, all of a sudden you start hearing something, and then you see it. Here it comes. It's that airplane that's flying just fast enough to stay up in the air, and it's pulling a banner, right? Big, huge banner that says, Eat at Joe's rent a jet ski, whatever. And I don't know about you, but when that banner starts coming across through there, I don't care what it is, I cannot get my eyes off of it. I'm watching it the whole way across. And then it gets out of sight. And then I take a deep breath, and I'm, I'm getting back concentrating again. Maybe I'm reading a book, maybe I'm doing whatever. So I get, get to start back again, and then all of a sudden I hear it again. And it's coming back the other way. Those, it, it may be funny for us to talk about, because, but that's the best way that I know how to explain those things because what that banner is, is in my daily quiet time, that's what Satan uses to keep me from concentrating. He puts those things that just slowly go across my mind and keep me from focusing on what God wants me to be reading. And once, before we move on, am I the only one that's got this problem? Please tell me I'm not the only one that's got this problem. Okay, good. 
<clears throat> so there's all sorts of ways to uh, combat distractions. You can read aloud. You can put your phone in another room, make notes in a journal while you're reading, listen to music, and on and on. But if the Bible is that hard, if, the re if reading it, the Bible is that hard, then why should I do it anyway? If I can't read for more than a minute or two without my wi mind wandering off, why should I even try? We find the answer to this question in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. God's Word is and will forever li be literally breathed by God, unchanging, given to us by God, written down without error by men inspired by God. Author uh, Wayne Grudem defines the sufficiency of Scripture this way. The sufficiency of Scripture means that Scripture contains all the words of God he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history, and that it now contains all the words we need for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. Amen? I've taken the liberty to combine uh, Psalm uh, verses 105 and 111, if you'll take a look at those. I've combined those to come up with what I think is the basis for uh, daily Bible reading and the meditation, which uh, leads me to my focus today. God's Word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and provides blessing to those who follow com God's commands and store up His Word in our heart so that we might not sin against Him. Let's look at a few other verses in Psalms to corroborate the statement. First off, consistently reading and meditating on Scripture provides us with blessing. Look right there at the beginning in verses 1 and 2. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the way of the Lord. Blessed are those whose who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Right here from the very first verses in this chapter, the psalmist tells us that there are blessings for those who keep God's commandments. God wants to bless those who follow his ways, and, only to, and the only way to receive those blessings is to seek after him consistently, constantly, and totally. James Boyce put it this way, Apart from being instructed by God, human beings do not know how to achieve happiness. However, it is impossible to receive the blessings promised here and in many other places in the Bible if we just sit, if we just read them and do nothing else. Charles Bert Spurgeon said, A man may sit in the road without soiling his skin or fouling his apparel, but that is not enough. There must be project, practical action, in the Christian life, and in order to receive blessedness, he must do something for the Master. How are we to receive these blessings unless we store up his word in our hearts? Next, God blesses those who read his word, but he also commands his law to be kept. Look at verse 4. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. God is serious about the instructions he's given us. They are not suggestions. And here the psalmist makes no bones about it. We're commanded to keep God's edicts. Jesus refers back to the Old Testament many times when he says it is written. He uses this term when he teaches many times rebuking to show how important it is to know God's law. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. How are we to obey God's law unless we store up his word in our hearts so that we can keep his commandments? Reading and meditating scripture also keeps us from sin. Look at verses uh, 9 through 11, which say, How can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it against your word? With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I love using an app called Enduring Word. It's a Bible commentary written by David Guzik. It's uh, free and I highly recommend it. 
Uh, his commentary is also available in the Blue Letter Bible app, so if you're already using it, that's a resource there. David is plain spoken and is a good example of this, of this in his comment on verse 9, where he says, The world tells us, have a good time when you're young. Get it all out of your system. When you're older, you can settle down and be religious and proper. However, God's answer is quite different. He says, if you're going to live for me, you must begin at the earliest possible moment without delay, preferably when you're young. Why does God call us when we're young? Because it goes on to say, it's because God wants us to spare, wants to spare the young man the bondage of sin. This reflects upon the power of experience to shape our habits, surrender to any temptation, transfer it from the realm of mental contemplation to life experience, and that temptation becomes much more difficult to resist in the future. Each successive experience of surrender to temptation builds a habit, reinforced not only spiritually, but by brain chemistry. Such ingrained habits are more and more difficult to break the more they are experienced, and it is almost impossible to break such habits without replacing them with another habit. Such is the issue of our fallen nature. Bad habits are much easier to develop and to keep than development of good, godly habits. Verse 15 shows us a good way to keep and develop a uh, wholesome habit. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. And also verse 101, I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. God's word also helps us, keeps us from sinning as we store, mentioned in verse 11, your word by meditating which is in verse 15, on his word resulting in, in being able to stay away from sin, verse 101. I'll remind you again, God's word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and, a, and provides blessings for those who follow God's command to store up his word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. God also gives us the ability to understand his teaching. Remember I mentioned earlier that we absolutely must pray first, asking God to give us the ability to comprehend and retain what we're reading. The psalmist prayed for understanding in several verses, which include 18, 27, 34, 104. Uh, let's look at a couple of these quickly. Verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Verse 27 Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. Verse 34, give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Verse 104, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. In all these verses, the psalmist is asking God for the ability to, to make a, his word a part of his very being. If we're going to be serious about our relationship with God, we too must earnestly pray that His Word become our lifeblood. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not standing before you this morning telling you that I've arrived at this point. No, I'm nothing more than a thankful sinner saved by grace who exists only because of that grace. There's also hope in God's Word. In verse 145, with my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. Verse 146, I call you, save me that I may observe your testimonies. 147, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. Here the psalmist is calling out to God because he wants to keep the word of God a cry for obedience in his life. He is asking, pleading with God for wisdom, strength, and the ability to obey God. But look at 147 again, where he says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. The psalmist gets up early, prays for understanding, and then puts his faith in God's word. He makes God's word a, light unto, a lamp unto his feet, a light unto his path, and stores up his word in his heart 
so that he might not sin against him. God's word also provides us with a readiness to share Jesus. Look at uh, verse 41 and 42. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation, according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for them who, who, him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Verse 46, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be put to shame. Your consistent behavior may be what wins them over to Christ, but your ability to recall scripture comes from the grace of God after consistent study, examination, and memorization of scripture. And lastly, but most importantly, God provides salvation through his word. Verse 154 through 156 says, Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your promise. Verse 174 through 76 says, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your light and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a sheep. Seek your servant, for I for do not forget your commandments. Alan, you guys can come on up. <clears throat> Please realize that we've only scratched the surface of, of Psalm 119. I asked you earlier to please read that. Um, there is so much information there about the importance of reading Scripture. But the bottom line is Scripture is sufficient. Scripture is sufficient for our daily lives, for our relationships, for raising our children, and on and on. Scripture is sufficient, and the only way to totally understand this statement is to commit yourself to the study and memorization of God's Word. If you've not made the decision to read your Bible daily, please make that commitment now. You cannot know, you cannot know completely God's will for your life if you don't read and meditate on His Word. Also, if you have not come to a point in your life where you've set the world aside and, followed, and want to follow Jesus, I urge you to do that now. Kyle, Jasper, Allen, or myself would love to meet with you and help you with any questions that you might have about salvation and baptism. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the opportunity that we have to actually hold it in our hands. Thank you that we don't have to depend on someone else to read it to us, but we have the ability if we will only take advantage of it to study and meditate on your word daily. I pray now that your word this morning has touched hearts here and that we all realize the eternal importance of immersing ourselves in your word constantly and crying out to you for obedience to your laws and your precepts. Amen.